Now Thomas, meow, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. <laughs> so the other disciples told him, We have seen, we have, the, Lord. We have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord. We have seen, we have seen, the, seen the, Lord. the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among oh, them and said, How did he get here? Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Ooh, gross. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Friends, I don't know about you, but this Easter has been a bit rough. I remember going to Target the week before Easter to brave the world and do my one weekly trip outside of the house. On my way out, a display of Easter dresses caught my eye. And there were rows and rows of these beautiful fabrics, pastel aisles of promise and spring. And for a moment, my eyes lit up, running my hands along the fabric. I've always loved wearing a, a good floral dress for this holiday of renewal and new beginnings. It's kind of my yearly ritual. And I put one up to myself in the mirror to see what it might look like and I felt instantly and completely foolish. I mean, what am I thinking? I thought, what does it matter? It felt silly and girlish to think that there's any point in putting on a dress like that. I mean, I was just gonna eat my sad bland brunch in my pajamas on Easter morning in my apartment anyway. I just couldn't really muster up the optimism to dress for the season. Until this crisis is over, I'll just wear sweatpants. I remember saying to myself in the mirror, I won't try. I don't want to try. I'll get myself together and have hope once I have proof that this is past. Then I'll wear the dress. In today's scripture, we hear a pretty famous passage about someone who didn't want to put on some false optimism to propel himself right into the promises of the return of Christ. Oh, Doubting Thomas, as he's nicknamed, the guy pinned as the skeptic of the Bible, the Eeyore who sucks the life out of the party of the resurrection, who doesn't want to join in until he has the proof. I mean, <laughs> come on, Thomas, can't you just get on board with the program and just believe? I was always really frustrated by Thomas, annoyed by his doubt, not always sympathetic, but this moment has softened my feelings for Thomas. His struggle feels pretty real right now. A little background on Thomas. He is a faithful servant of God with a pretty impressive streak of faithfulness at that. For example, near the end of Jesus's earthly ministry, some people in Judea were plotting Jesus's demise. It was during this time that Jesus and the disciples received the news that their friend Lazarus was at the point of death, and going to visit Lazarus near Jerusalem was dangerous, as that area was not hospitable to Christians at the time. Fearing for their lives, the disciples tried to talk Jesus out of returning to Lazarus's hometown of Bethany, but Thomas really backed Jesus up and said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas's ride or die readiness to stay with Jesus is pretty noteworthy and to risk his own safety, incredibly admirable and brave. These are the words of a really loyal disciple. But on the day of his resurrection, Jesus appeared to a group of his disciples. And for some reason that is never revealed, Thomas wasn't with them during that incredible reveal. 
he missed out big time. When the disciples later told Thomas that they had seen the resurrected Lord, he replied, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Will not, cannot, choose not, refuse to. I don't know about you, but I can understand Thomas's cautiousness to not rejoice until he has the proof, especially during this time when it can be really hard to believe, to be satisfied by God's promises in the midst of this global event that's so unsettling and uncertain. And it feels like the ground is coming out beneath us. I know that I wanna to cling to something solid, to see some tangible proof, some real hard evidence and numbers that there's light at the end of this tunnel some data point and hard fact that I can wrap my mind around to soothe this gnawing anxiety and worry. Because to believe, it takes a lot of courage. It's so much easier right now to doubt. It feels safer to cling to the word unless or accept, like Thomas, as a bargaining chip to qualify our belief. This bargaining can make us feel like we have some control that we can stave off disappointment until we get the real evidence. And I'm not saying that we have to force ourselves to be Pollyannas and embrace some sort of fake optimism, some grin and bear it, grit your teeth through it kind of attitude to become a sort of hallmarky Christian who says well-meaning but cringeworthy platitudes like keep your chin up, you know, God only gives his hardest battles to his strongest soldiers. Or just remember that God makes all things beautiful in his time. You'll get through this. No, I mean, that kind of saccharine Christian hope is like Splenda. Seems real for a moment, but ultimately it's fake. And there's a quote that I can't seem to shake off from the novelist Kurt Vonnegut, who puts in the mouth of one of his characters in Mother Night this strong statement about that kind of bullheaded faith. Say what you will about the sweet miracle of unquestioning faith. I consider it a capacity for it, terrifying and absolutely vile. I remember the first time I read this quote and it honestly took me back. How can someone say that the capacity for faith is terrifying, destructive even? I can see where he's coming from and that sometimes Christians can be seen as not having a very nuanced view of what it means to be a true and mature person of faith. However, a real person of faith isn't someone who just blindly believes and doesn't ask the big questions of God. A person of true substantive faith isn't like a helpless baby bird that just opens its mouth up to be fed the truth and swallows it without a second, a second glance. A person of God isn't someone who sucks up all the sweetness and doesn't take a big long look at the hard stuff. That sort of unquestioning can be destructive. I think Thomas understood that. He didn't want to just swallow what he was told, to live on other people's testimonies. He wanted to really know who Christ was like and to see and to touch the truth himself. He wanted a true encounter, an experience with the risen Christ. He wanted um, he questioned not to poke holes in the argument for Christ, like a Dawkins sort of skeptic who questions and doubts just to see how watertight something is, to prove something's in existence, and to perform an autopsy to, and destroy the mystery in the process. Unlike that, Thomas wanted to know the truth intimately, not just to hear it secondhand from hearsay. He wanted to touch the wounds of Christ to make sure that he really did come, that God's promises were true, that God is faithful to his word and doesn't abandon us. Christ, I don't think, blames anyone for wanting to be sure. God is gracious and invites Thomas to touch him and to satisfy his need to know. Sometimes we doubt out of fear of not wanting to be disappointed, to be seen as gullible. 
We would rather look like an intelligent observer than trust and risk having our hearts broken. Fool me once. If my hopes will be dashed, I will not risk and put my hope, you know, put my hope out a second time. We think we want hard evidence, but what we really are seeking is an encounter with God, intimacy. I believe that many of us are conditioned by experiences to insulate ourselves from disappointment. We keep our guard up. We know life is painful and difficult and often fails to live up to our hopes and expectations. But friends, you didn't just sleepwalk your whole life and end up in church. It's a process of being unsure, disappointed, and showing up despite the risk. Heck, it might have taken every effort for you to put on your sweatpants and God knows how many cups of coffee to just turn on your computer today to tune into worship. Faith is orienting yourself towards the spirit of God, towards the way of Jesus. Wrestling is part of the process and doubt is a part of the equation. But friends, doubt, it can't be the end point. God walks through the doors, the doors of our hearts, to reach us, to say, look, here I am. You can touch me and know I am real. It's an active process of continually turning yourself towards God's love, God's justice, and God's mercy. And yes, even God's joy. If you give your tenderness and unsureness and disappointments to God, to reveal to God the tender and vulnerable places of doubt in your lives, then you are positioned to go forward in faith. Faith is a continual process, friends. You may not feel like wearing your spring dress now, but you can start believing in God now. Even if it's hard and you don't feel quite there yet, God doesn't judge. He meets our wounded places by letting us touch his own wounds, like a mirror saying, I see you and know you, and you see me and know me, but I've transcended this and you will too. Touch and know deeply that I am your God. Amen.